Thank you for staying with us right here on Bradama. This is episode 11, season 3.0 of Medical Today with me, Jared Pratnam. We've got an awesome show coming your way, as always. Uh, we'll be talking about urological care for patients. We'll be having a Dr. Rajendran from uh, KPJ Damansara Specialist Hospital. He'll be joining us shortly. Uh, we'll also be talking about disinfecting wounds with an antiseptic uh, solution. We have a video on that for you. First aid mistakes, we call that. But for now, let's talk about supplements. I mean, the world over, we're spending billions with regards to supplements. All of us want to be in the pink of health at all times. And we know that by the food we eat, we don't get or derive much vitamins or minerals from it. So we need supplements. And to do that, we have with us Emily Chai, consultant pharmacist from Blackmores, Malaysia, to talk about supplements and what we need to know as Malaysians about supplements. Emily, welcome to the show. It's uh, good to have you on the show. And uh, this is one of my more interesting or rather my topic of interest simply because I love supplements and I love shopping at <laughs> pharmacies all the time. So uh, uh, to start off the conversation, I'd like to talk about supplements. Why do we take it or why must we take it? Okay. Thank you for having me. All right. Firstly, um, why do we need supplements? Okay. Firstly, it's for the nutrients. All right. And why do we need nutrients? Nutrients is basically food for our cells. All right. All our organs will need nutrients, right? So when we talk about nutrients, we are actually talking about vitamins, minerals. All right. And we are actually lacking of it. All right. Why? Mm -hmm. Because of the diet. All right, that we're taking and also um, the lifestyle that we have all right when we are stressed we tend to deplete in vitamins and minerals certain mm. vitamin and minerals so we need to top up with that so um, normally where do we get nutrients we get from the food right yeah but nowadays what are the type of food that we're taking <laughs> usually right fast food fast food chow fun yes yeah. um, Thai chow. correct yeah. a lot of carbs and yeah. we're not taking enough mm -hmm. vegetables and fruits right. and do you know how many types of fruits and vegetables are we supposed to take in a day mm -hmm. minimum five minimum five yes a day right, right it's also interesting you mentioned that because uh, when you look at uh, the amounts of potassium we need on a daily level I think the the number of bananas we eat <laughs> <laughs> doesn't quite cut it. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So, uh, looking at that alone, we now understand that we lack our body lacks the minerals and uh, vitamins, vitamins we need. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And at the same time, um, even if we do take um, you know vegetable fruits, you know enough of that, but sometimes um, we how much of the nutrients are still in the crops? I mean, in the in the mm -hmm, fruits mm -hmm. and vegetables that we are have, you know nowadays there is a over cultivation of the right. crops. You know then the soil they don't really give it time to actually replace the nutrients. So our f the the vegetables the natural food that we have sometimes mm -hmm. may not even have enough nutrients for us, and especially um, if we are living in a type of lifestyle you know nowadays stressful lifestyle right. you know we don't get enough sleep. We, um, you know, we get stressed. Mm -hmm. It actually depletes the nutrients from our body. I, I guess yes. even if you're looking at vegetables <laughs> and fruit, uh, yep. the way we cook them also Correct. is something we need to question ourselves about. No, yes, how, definitely. How much nutrients are left in the food after they're cooked the exactly. way we like them to be? Yeah. Yes, actually, mm. um, you know, ideally we should eat the f the f uh, the vegetables raw, but you know, not everybody can eat raw mm -hmm, food, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Right. So. Which brings into question supplements. Now, Correct. with regards to supplements, uh, there are a lot of there are a lot of rules to supplements and how you should take them. Now, there also is a recommendation yep. for adults and young adults mm -hmm. or, or uh, young people who are uh, getting very active or having an active lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Now, what health supplements would you recommend for young adults and uh, senior citizens? Okay, um, for young adults, normally their complaints would be tiredness, mm -hmm. all right, stress, um, low immunity, all right, because they tend to you know sleep less. The way they eat their food will be more you know unhealthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so usually I would recommend um, a, a multivite. Okay, right. firstly a multivite, all right, which actually covers. Uh, all the vit most sure. of the vitamins. When you say multivites, yep. right, so mm. this is something I really like very much. When you say multivites, there's just so many different ranges out there. Yep. Essentially, in a multivitamin, what are you looking for? Usually, multivite, it, most important is you contain all the main vitamins, 
like A, B, C, D, E, uh, K, all right? And the minerals, you will need zinc, magnesium, calcium, all right? Um, those are the basic ones. Okay, mm -hmm. when you talk about multivitamin, the, the nutrients, how to say, the strength in each of the vitamin and minerals, mm -hmm. they are not high. Okay, right. they are just, you know, just enough to cover the daily nutrient um, needs, all mm -hmm. right? Um, we call it nutritional insurance, meaning you're taking just in case you don't have enough. Right. right? right. Because we don't know. We can't right. check, okay, I don't have enough certain vitamins. So um, you, you take that just in case you don't have enough of certain uh, vitamins and minerals. So right. now, now they do, uh, and, and I'm digressing here, sorry yep. about this, but they say that you need to do a baseline test about your, your levels of minerals and vitamins. Do people actually do that before they go out and buy supplements these days? Um, I mean, it's not common to do it. Not you know? common here. Yeah, not uh, common here. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, um, it's additional expenses. Like, I mean, we were to do it. Normally, people don't do that. Right. Yeah, so we usually just take a multivite because um, it's it's just basically so to it's cover a ge your basic general insurance. Correct. Most yeah. people can take, yes. Mm -hmm. Like how you, you know, you buy insurance, right? So right. you just in case okay. you don't have, you know. So when yeah, you just they say a lot of people put emphasis or a lot of... Uh, doctors and, and, and people in the medical industry put a lot of emphasis on fish oil. Correct. Now, at what age do you start taking fish oil? Okay, usually fish oil, to be honest, you can actually start from young because children can take fish oil. And in fact, um, mm -hmm. pregnant mothers should already be taking fish oil already because the baby, um, they need to develop their brain and right. their eyes. Which so and uh, fish oil contain the DHA, mm -hmm. which actually nourishes the eyes and the brain. So actually, from the womb, you already need to take, you know. Right. So and you can take, you know, from children, school ch uh, going children, um, teenagers. They should mm -hmm. take because they are, you know, studying mm -hmm. in college or mm -hmm. uni, and they do need that extra DHA for their memory you know to memorize their exams or right, whatever right. and definitely the the adults i mean the young adults and also the the elderly because you know for their heart right so for, mm. for cardiovascular reasons <coughs> correct you need to always supplement with uh, or supplement with <coughs> uh, fish oil yeah? correct now, they, uh, for for the senior citizens uh, it's usually recommended that they have uh, something for their joints correct. they also talk about <coughs> coq10 mm. but when you look at uh glucosamine and chondroitin a little something we use for joint aches all the time yep uh, some people cannot tolerate chondroitin and glucosamine simply because it gives them a heartburn oh, yeah right, right. <coughs> so you know how do you go, go around that Usually, we recommend to take after food. After food, correct, yeah. mm -hmm. because um, there are some, compl yeah, like you said, there are some people who actually cannot tolerate, um, you know, taking glucosamine before food. I can't tolerate taking glucosamine before food. I'll get like a ga gastric. Gastric. So I usually just take it after, and there is actually no difference between taking before or after meal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the efficacy, it's the same. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, so just take it after. Another very interesting thing that people <coughs> al always talk about now is CoQ10. Yep. Yeah, it started off uh, about 10 to 12 years ago. Mm. It started gaining some traction. But today, they say, especially if you're on statins, you're on cholesterol medicine, Correct. you should uh, supplement that with a CoQ10. Now, yes. with CoQ10, there's ubiquinone and ubiquinol. Yes. Okay, how do we uh, differentiate what's good for us? Okay, uh, firstly, maybe I'll just explain a little bit about why we need CoQ10. Mm -hmm. Basically, CoQ10 is a type of enzyme all right, mm -hmm. which actually nourishes our cells. Okay, so each of our organs will have cells, right? So we need CoQ10 to nourish all our organs, all right? And definitely we need a CoQ10 for our heart because our heart never stops pumping, all right? It never stops working. And we do need, they would, it will need more CoQ10 compared to all the other organs. Right. That is why it's, people always associate CoQ10 with heart, mm -hmm. with the heart health. All right, and your question about ubiquinone and ubiquinol. Right. All right, I know there are in the market, you know, um, people do sell the ubiquinol form, mm -hmm. all right, which they say that it's this active form. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. Um, but actually, our body is able to convert the ubiquinone to become ubiquinol. Right. All right, our body is capable of doing it. Mm -hmm. So it's just that it's up to you. I mean, if you want to take um, uh, the ubiquinol, it's fine. It's just that it's a little bit more pricey. Mm -hmm. All right, but in the end, if you take the ubiquinone, which is the, the, the initial form, it will, your body will convert it. Right. Your body will convert. It's, right. Yeah, it will still work. Yes. So uh, from there, let's move into two very important demographics, women yep. and children. Yep. Now, uh, for pregnant women mm -hmm. or women uh, who are going through menopause, yeah. um, 
what would be the go-to standard for them mm -hmm. with regards to supplementing? Okay, firstly, I will go to uh, talk about um, pregnancy, all mm -hmm. right? So pregnancy, the first thing that you must remember is folic acid. It is extremely important. Folic acid. Correct. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people don't know that folic acid, you should take at least three months before you conceive, right. all right? Yes, a lot of people, they, don't, they, they thought that folic acid is to increase the chance of them getting pregnant, but actually it's not. It's actually to prevent what we call... Um, a spinal condition, what we call spina bifida, mm -hmm. yeah, which is actually a, a, a debilitating disease, all right, and they have it for life. They right. need to go for surgery if they have this condition. And uh, we do have cases where people actually do, you know, they, 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 their children get that, the babies, mm -hmm. you know, are born with spina bifida and they regret for not taking folic acid during that, you know, when right. they are so supposed to. Yeah. So it's folic acid and iodine. Iodine right. is right. for the brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now with folic acid, how much do you take? You know, what, what would be the re uh, uh, a decent dose or recommended dose? Okay, minimum is 400 uh, mcg, all right? Um, but for someone who has high risk, like say you have family member who has um, spina bifida before, mm -hmm. or maybe you have a miscarriage, uh, right. history of miscarriage usually we will recommend 5 mg mm -hmm. so it's yeah much more so there's also mm. uh, things that uh, that women need to take into consideration would be uh, calcium epo and bio e these things are also very important uh, wh what what is your advice on this okay for um all right for menopausal women or premenopausal women usually we recommend them to take calcium calcium is extremely important mm -hmm. why because as a woman reach menopause um, age, all right, which is about 50, um, usually the estrogen level will drop. Right. Okay? And usually the, the calcium will deplete from the bones. And therefore, you see most of the time women who actually, you know, when they go and test their bone density and all that, they mm -hmm. actually have very poor, uh, low density bone, all right, which actually causes osteoporosis. Right. Yeah. So, um, and, and it's, there is a risk of fracture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we don't want them to get the fracture because right. usually when they get a fracture, they don't last, um, I mean, they cannot survive very long. So, hence yes. why your, mm. your calcium intake is very important. Correct, And correct. at this point, the recommended dose would be? Usually, uh, we will recommend as a rule at of least thumb, yeah. rule 1000 mg mm -hmm. uh, for most people and uh, most adults. Right. For uh, menopausal women, we will recommend uh, 1200 mg. So, is it yes. just calcium or should calcium be uh, coupled with something else uh, mm. for proper absorption? Vitamin D. Vitamin Definitely, D. you need vitamin mm. D. All mm -hmm. right. Vitamin D is the one, it's like, you know, imagine yourself, you know, you have a wall. Right. Okay, you have the bricks. Mm -hmm. Okay, the bricks are your calcium. Right. Okay. And uh, vitamin D is like your cement, the mm -hmm. one that holds the bricks together. Right. So now you need both. You need both. To yeah. keep, in, keep it strong. Right. So very quickly, yep. for children, what do you mm -hmm. recommend for children when it comes to looking for supplements for your young ones? You know, there are yeah. so many nice looking ones out there. <laughs> what, do you, what do you buy? Yes, yeah. yes. I, I feel tempted to eat them as well. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Usually, uh, children, you know, they're very picky eaters. Yep. You know, children tend to like, you know, they don't like um, vegetables and fruits. They want just white stuff you know mm -hmm. uh, fries rice bread so um, they are not getting enough nutrients so I would definitely recommend a multivitamin mm -hmm. and minerals all right which is combined Some, something chewy um, yeah, for well, kids. yeah definitely they yeah. need something that can chew mm -hmm. but I want to uh, highlight that there are a lot in the market which are actually loaded with sugar right yes uh -huh. correct it tastes good but the thing is you are feeding your children with all this sugar so you need to really be careful mm -hmm. yeah and try to look for something which has uh, you know um, which doesn't have the preservatives um, artificial sweeteners colorings mm -hmm. yeah try to look for that kind of supplements yeah, right. possible now, now the other thing that people always talk about when they buy supplements is its efficacy and how long it will take for it to start working now uh, generally when you buy a supplement or when you start taking a supplement how long does it take for you to see some decent effects oh right okay so um for supplements usually um people will associate it as for long term right i mean actually it's supposed to be taken for long term and it's like for prevention but actually there are some supplements which actually can be used for what we call treatment mm -hmm. all right so for example uh, magnesium all right magnesium can be used for things like migraine right so you you yeah. you, you want to relax your muscles Correct. You want to go to sleep. Mus yeah go yeah. to sleep have a better rest uh -huh. you know? but here's the mm. thing with too much magnesium 
it might cause you a bit of diarrheal problems. Oh, you're good. Yeah. All right. I'm, so I'm, I'm just, I'm just you know, <laughs> off the top of my head, yeah. Yes, you're but right. But I tried all this. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. Okay, but it's only above a certain amount, all mm-hmm. right? And usually people won't take. It's like maybe nine tablets a day, right. which usually people will not take that, mm-hmm. that amount. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so not to worry about it. If you really do experience any diarrhea whatsoever, mm-hmm. just stop it or cut right. down the dose. The diarrhea will stop. Right. No problem. But but here's yeah. some questions that came in, you know, via people who've sent it in uh, through our uh, email. And uh, one of the questions that came across, which is very important, I think, is yep. if you have a whole hand of supplements, mm-hmm. can you take them all together? You know, mm. is there a proper way of taking supplements, like a proper time for taking a different set of supplements? Okay. Um, usually uh, recommended, as I mentioned earlier, after food is the best time to take your supplements. Mm-hmm. All right, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, I believe yes, there are a lot of people who take a lot at one go. So. Um, Okay, general rule of thumb, it is okay to take them together, but there are a few minerals which we don't recommend to take them together. Uh, For example? Okay, um, usually they are like zinc, Mm -hmm. magnesium, calcium, okay, because they tend to interact with each other, like they kind of block the absorption of each other, Mm -hmm. but usually when it's only taken at high strength. Right. All right. If you're not sure, um, you can just split them apart two hours, mm-hmm. just to be safe. Right. Yep. So uh, the the other problem is taking your medications with your supplements. Now, mm. a lot of people, uh, you know, are afraid, especially you know, with uh, Doctor Google teaching you so much these days. <laughs> yes. You've got your supplements in one hand, and you've got meds in the other Correct. hand. Hypertensive, cardiovascular drugs. You have your NCDs drugs. Your NCDs safe for your uh, what do you call it? Di- diabetes mellitus. Mm. You know, what do you take first? What goes first? Yeah. All right. You know, because people mm. people are afraid of interactions. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Mm. Um, all right. A general rule of thumb: we would usually recommend you to take two hours apart, mm-hmm. meaning your supplements and your medication. Split it two hours apart. That's right. the general rule of thumb. But I mean, there are certain um, supplements which we do recommend them to be taken together. Okay. For example, um, people who take high blood pressure medication. They actually should take fish oil as well, mm-hmm. right? Because fish oil actually helps to make the you know balance the blood pressure actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when 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 you say but hypertension medicine, mm-hmm. you're talking about ACE inhibitors, anything ARBs, yes, anything at all. The general rule is the same thing. Yes, correct. Right. Yep. So mm. wh- what about people with? Uh, on warfarin or mm. blood thinning medicines, mm. okay? Yeah. So, uh, so cl- there's clopidogrel, there's uh, there's aspirin. Correct. Uh, there's uh, there's a few others out mm-hmm. there which are, mm. are new in yep. the market. Yep. So these things are very important, and the the fear of interaction or bleeding gums. These Correct. things are something that people worry about too. Yeah, yeah. Okay, for this kind of um, well, people who are taking you know blood thinning medications, mm-hmm. um, you know ma- mainly their concern is bleeding. Mm-hmm. Okay, so there are studies to show that um, basically it's only when you take fish oil at a, above a certain amount, mm-hmm. all right, uh, very high strength, that it may cause bleeding. Right. Only only if you take above a certain amount. If you're taking the normal dosing, like you know. Um, let's say the 1,000 mg fish oil, you're taking like two or three or even four um, Mm -hmm. um, capsules a day, that's fine. There is no, um, it won't cause bleeding issues. It's only if you take above, let's, uh, a good example would be 10 capsules a day. Let's say if you take more than 10 capsules a day, Mm -hmm. the risk of bleeding will be higher. Right. But if you take anything below that, it is still fine. Mm-hmm. Yes. We've got about two minutes left on the show. Time flies Ooh, really wow. quickly now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoying myself. <laughs> yeah. So n- now if I want information, where do I go to seek information yep. about health supplements? And uh, before we close, what would be your closing statement to mm. all of us being a specialist in this field? Okay. Firstly, um, for, for everyone who wants to take supplements um, and you're not sure about the dosing, you're not sure about the interactions, um, what you can do is you can actually go to what we call uh, pharmacists, okay, to actually uh, consult them. Okay, we have uh, trained a group of pharmacists. Uh, we have an institute, all right, we actually train pharmacists, a special professional training, okay, on health supplements, all right, and they actually are uh, able to give you proper consultation on uh, whether there's any interaction, whether what is the correct dosing to have the proper results, all right? So uh, they are called CMED accredited pharmacists, mm-hmm. which you can actually yes, look. CMED accredited pharmacists. Correct. Right. And you can actually see, uh, we have trained over 700 
uh, pharmacists, all right, mm -hmm. all over Malaysia, all right, with this course, this program, and uh, they uh, they are located in different type of pharmacies. So we have a list of their pharmacies locations, right. and it's found in the Blackmores uh, website, Blackmores mm -hmm. Malaysia website. Right. So all mm. you need to do is go to the Blackmores. Malaysia website and you'll get all the information you need. Yes. Very quickly, we've got yep. about 40 seconds left. Yep. Your message to Malaysia. Okay, um, most important, um, remember, uh, you know, take your supplements at the right dosing. Okay, that's very, very important because a lot of people take supplements and they're taking at the wrong dose. You know, they're just taking one capsule, two capsule, actually mm -hmm. it doesn't even work. Right. So yeah, that's why they don't see results. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so make sure the dosing is correct. Okay, and if you're unsure, Remember, go back to see your pharmacist. If you're unsure, yes. I think that's the most important advice. Go back to see your pharmacist. On that note, we'd like to thank Emily Chai, consultant pharmacist from Blackmores Malaysia, joining us right here on Medical Today. Emily, it was a pleasure and an honor having you in the studio. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Stay with us. We're going to take a short break and we'll be back with more right here on Medical Today. Do you experience indigestion, bloating, or stomach upsets? You need Blackmore's Digestive Enzymes Plus. Made from natural enzymes and ginger, it helps to break down your food so all the nutrients can be absorbed by your body. Healthy tummy, happy you! Hello and welcome back to Medical Today with me, Gerard Ratnam. We just spoke about supplements a while ago and how important it is to make sure you have good levels at all times. From there, we move into urology and uh, we're going to be talking about ur urological care for patients. Now, urology is a surgical speciality that apparently deals with the treatment of conditions that involve the male and the female urinary tract and the male reproductive organs. Now, uh, joining me in the studio is Dr. Rajendran Sundaralingam. He's a consultant urologist and a u urological surgeon from KPJ Damansara Specialist Hospital to give us an insight as to what he does. Now, my first question to you is about spinal cord injury. We were meant to talk about uh, urology and urological problems, but we're talking about spinal cord. Yes, thanks, Gerard. Now, it's quite interesting, you know, many people don't realize uh, what's the relationship between spinal cord and something down there. But in fact, spinal cord actually, sp actually is a relay system from the brains mm. and actually controls many other things. It controls your bowel, it controls your bladder, it controls your movements of your body, it controls many other things. And many people don't realize that once you have a spinal cord injury, it takes over the function, it removes the function of other organs. And one of the organs that is affected is bladder. And uh, if one does not uh, look after the bladder well after spinal cord injury, they can actually uh, succumb to kidney failures as well because mm -hmm. uh, because the, this, uh, the bladder may get very distended, kidney right. may get very swollen. Right. And uh, this, uh, this is very important morbidity and mortality for as far as uh, spinal cord injuries are concerned. Right. So before we get into conversation, my second question to you would uh, be uh, to tell the difference between a paraplegic, a quadriplegic, and a tetraplegic, just so we know what we're talking about. A paraplegic is somebody who cannot move both the lower limbs of the body. That means both the legs is completely paralyzed. It can either be paraplegia when it's completely paralyzed or paraparesis when there's weakness of the limbs. Mm -hmm. Now, tetra and quadri are the same thing. It means four. So, tetraplegia and quadriplegia is the same term. That means you cannot move both your upper limbs and lower limbs. That means the legs, hands cannot move at all. Then we call the person as uh, the, 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 the condition as tetraplegia or quadriplegia. Mm -hmm. And when there's weakness, we con consider it as tetraparesis or quadriparesis. Right. So they basically, they're actually the same terms. Right. So now with, with all these problems, we know that people with spinal injuries or spinal cord injuries will suffer from some kind of urological problems. What are the main problems you see or what are the main uh, causes or, or uh, symptoms that present themselves when someone uh, is become a quadriplegic, a uh, paraplegic or a tetraplegic? See, once, once uh, uh, when the spinal cord injury has occurred, they actually go into what's known as a spinal shock. Mm 
Mm-hmm. There are about three to four stages of a spinal shock. They become completely paralyzed, lose, lose all their reflexes. And then this, after, after a few weeks, they gain back the reflexes. Then only we can determine how bad this paralysis is, whether it's due to a complete spinal cord injury or due to an incomplete spinal cord injury. Mm-hmm. Now, it's very important to, to determine this. So th- what, what the spinal surgeon or orthopedic surgeon does is they actually uh, evaluate the patient, assess the patient that time itself and determine by what is known as an ASIA or ASIA grading system. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's determined as ASIA A. B, C, D, or E, E, which is normal. A, B, C, D, D or double E. Or, or E, 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 e yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. Now, based on that, they will know whether this patient has got, they, they have to determine whether this is a complete a spinal cord injury or an incomplete spinal cord injury. But incomplete spinal cord injury, they can present in different ways. Mm-hmm. They can present as, as a sensory, sensory loss, a motor loss, the extent of the motor loss, and so forth. Right. Now, the, the, the odd thing about the bladder is, you see, when we talk about the bladder, when a person pa- wants to pass urine, there, there are so many other functions that you need to talk to about. Whether the bladder has to be normal and the sphincter which controls the urine has to be normal. Normally, when a, uh, an individual wants to pass urine, the bladder has to contract, the sphincter has to relax. relax. The bladder has to contract and the sphincter, sphincter has, has to, to relax. relax. Okay. okay. Mm-hmm. After passing urine, they have to hold the bladder. The right. bladder has to be relaxed. The sphincter, sphincter has, has to be co- contract. contracted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, anything other than this is already a disorder of the bladder. So, the disorder of the bladder can either be an a uncontrolled contraction of the bladder or a completely relaxed bladder. Mm-hmm. At the same time, an uncontrolled uh, contraction of the sphincter and a completely relaxed sphincter. With this, you can have different permutation and combinations. Mm-hmm. A completely contractible bladder with a contractible sphincter as well, mm-hmm. or a contractible bladder with totally relaxed sphincter, or a relaxed bladder with totally contracted sphincter, or a relaxed bladder totally contracted, uh, t- totally relaxed sphincter. Right. It's very so confusing, but yes, yeah, that's uh, a lot of information so you, you, there. In in fact, we call we, we use this term synergy, mm-hmm. where when there's contraction of the bladder the sphincter has to relax, relax. When the so it bladder, has to work in concert yeah, yeah. It, it has to work in what's known as synergy mm-hmm. now we have to determine in this these cases with spinal cord injuries we have to determine whether this patient has got a problem with the bladder and right. the sphincter right and what is the relationship and what type of bladder and sphincter problem we are dealing with so we have to actually assess go through the history go through the examination uh, we do some x-rays or ct scans or mris right but uh, but but i guess if if you're dealing with someone who has a spinal cord injury it's either uh, an overactive bladder or an underactive bladder uh, yes it's either an overactive bladder or underactive bladder but it's not as simple as that you mm-hmm. can have an overactive bladder with Overactive sphincter, overactive ab bladder, underactive sphincter. Right, so the technicalities uh, can vary yes, quite can vary. a bit. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. What I, why I'm saying this is because when we assess the patients, uh, it's not only just thinking of whether it's overactive or underactive. Mm-hmm. We have to ensure that we are dealing with properly so because the treatment will differ. So finally, what we do is we do what is known as a urodynamic test where we use pressure catheters into the rectum and into the bladder then right. we determine so the function of the bladder pressure catheters are, are put through the rectum and, and the, the bladder, bladder. Okay. yes and, and and how does it work then and then we, we fill up the bladder with uh, some mm-hmm. saline solution we see the activity of the bladder based on the activity of the bladder we can see pressure movements normally when we fill up the bladder it should be known as a stable bladder in other words there's no pressure rise there's hardly any pressure rise the bladder expands well mm-hmm. When there's overactivity, the bladder suddenly becomes very unstable. The pressure starts rising. The pressure starts oscillating. It starts fluctuating. Right. Okay. And then we know there's something wrong with the bladder. At the same time, we put EMG, which mm-hmm. is known as electromagnetic uh, uh, electrodes mm-hmm. or, or surface electrodes over the peri, uh, over the right. bottom area. Right. And we can see the sphincter so you, activity as so well. So you're using surface electrodes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. And then we, so we can know the relationship. There are two phases. One is a filling phase mm-hmm. where we fill the bladder with saline. We see the reaction of the bladder and the sphincter. And then it's a voiding phase or passing urine phase where the, where the individual passes urine while the catheters are still in place. Right. And then we'll determine whether it's a very high pressure bladder or low pressure bladder and whether the sphincter takes it or not. Right. So in, because of this, we can have different presentations of bladder. The person can become have a very overactive bladder, pa- always rushing and passing in urine. Mm-hmm. Or they can go into retention. Then the bladder is 
very full, full. very and, distended. And, and that uh, can back up into the kidneys. Yeah, that can back up into the kidneys. Mm -hmm. And then they can also present with a uh, very full bladder, but when they cough, suddenly all the urine comes out because the sphincter is not working right. Well. So that that, that uh, would be incontinence. Yeah. Yes, incontinence, mm -hmm. which leaking of the urine. Right. So these can present uh, these symptoms can present itself in someone with spinal cord injury. But uh, let's talk about the normal person who starts having, say, incontinence. I think that would be a problem for seniors or some of us, you know, with bad luck, we get it in our 40s and early 50s. Yeah. Uh, what can be done about this? Okay, so basically when you have incontinence, it's actually leaking of urine. Mm -hmm. uh, it may be a simple topic, but actually there's so much more details in it. When a person leaks, we need to... It's also embarrassing, you know. Yes, it's also embarrassing yeah. and many patients uh, will not come and they meet us for it. Yeah. Uh, they will try to use pad or pampers or something like that. Mm. But yeah, it's very important that uh, for us to know that uh, the longer we live, we need to live with a quality of life. It's not just a quantity alone. So these pe people who leak, they can leak due to various causes. They can leak due to a bladder which is too overactive. Mm -hmm. So before they can reach the toilet, before they can open up the door, suddenly the urine comes out. Or they have to quickly rush in. Okay, like let's like say for example they are on the road on the highway, they can't reach to the restroom, they have to stop by the side of the road and just pass urine. Mm -hmm. So that is due to too much of overactive for the bla uh, bladder and the urine comes out. Sometimes there can be a retention due to prostate and uh, prostate compression or prostate enlargement. Oh, let's not go there yet because uh, I want to come to that topic very, very soon. Yeah, it's something so, uh, there's a bit uh, a few misconceptions with regards oh, yes, to that. There is, yeah. I'll, 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 we'll, we'll come to that. So, okay, so okay. sometimes it's related to that. Yeah, yeah. So, so that is known as overflow incontinence. Mm -hmm. Same thing like a glass of water. Right. You pour in a water, it's too much overflow, it starts leaking out. So same thing, sometimes you can get an over-distended bladder. The bladder is too full with urine and it just invariably just comes out. That's known as over in, overflow incontinence. Right. Then we have such thing known as stress incontinence. Mm -hmm. A person is normal, the bladder is completely normal, but the sphincter which controls the urine is a bit weak. So the person coughs, coughs and suddenly the urine comes out. There's known as stress yeah, incontinence. And this presents itself a lot from what we understand yeah. and from what I read. A lot of women have Yes, a lot of women, especially in multiple pregnancies, mm -hmm. or if there's an obstetrical injury, mm -hmm. let's say they're doing uh, some, some, some procedure or something like that and there's uh, some amount of injury, then they can present with stress incontinence. Some of these spinal cord injuries which affect the sphincter can also present the same thing. So that when they cough, they suddenly come out. Right. Now there's another thing known as functional incontinence, very important. It's not mainly due to a bladder or sphincter problem, but it's due to an elderly who cannot reach the toilet in time. Let's say you're now full bladder. You can always walk fast to the, to the, to the washroom, right? Mm -hmm. In an elderly person with so much of osteoarthritis, they cannot reach the toilet and suddenly the urine comes out. Right. This is not bladder or sphincter problem. Mm -hmm. It's due to the, the, the condition of the elderly person in reaching the toilet in time. It's interesting that all these uh, stories are making me want to go to the restroom now oh yes. for some reason. So, <laughs> so is me as well. <laughs> <laughs> now that, that means you have overactive bladder. Okay, so so uh, uh, the third one was functional incontinence. Yes, yep. yes. So with all these these bad stories you've given us, yeah. is there a light at the end of the tunnel? for? Yes, people? there's always a light at the end of the tunnel as far as urology is concerned. This is really... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, like, I like the fun in it. But okay, so w what can you do treatment-wise? Okay, treatment-wise, okay. First, we have to determine what we're dealing with. And very important to know it's a bothersome score of the person. Mm -hmm. Let's say, for example, we have, an, uh, we have a normal individual uh, retired, 65 years old mm -hmm. man, retired, you're just sitting uh, in the house doing nothing with your grandchildren, you have to pass urine one and a half hours, mm -hmm. Everyone, you have a washroom na by, na uh, by your side, you just go to the washroom and just pass urine and then uh, watch and drink your coffee and watch a movie or right. something like that. Right. But if you're a CEO or managing director, mm -hmm. you have to attend long meetings, you're in parliament or something, you cannot expect to just walk away every one hour, one and a half hours to uh, do this thing. So that is known as a bothersome score. Mm -hmm. It has to be bothersome enough. So when you deal with overactive bladder, you have to decide whether th 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 that, that, that individual mm -hmm. has got bothersome symptoms or not. Right. That means they can pass urine quite often, but it's not bothersome, it doesn't need treatment. Right. If uh, it's bothersome, yes. then you look into the different modalities yes, available. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it's very important to uh, uh, know this. Overactive bladder is not a disease or a disorder. Mm -hmm. It's a symptom complex. Tuberculosis is a disease. Malaria is a disease. But overactive bladder, is the term has been coined for such symptoms, which is bothersome, indicative for us, so that we can start treating right. them. 
Okay. But, but we've also misconstrued it yeah. as a disease. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I always speak to my patients because once when they read the internet and they see, oh, they're passing urine more than eight times a day, they get very panicky. Mm-hmm. But this is a qualitative disease, not a quantitative disease. Quantitative disease means like you have a cardiovascular problem, a heart problem or stroke or something like that. Your, 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 that your length length that we can, you can live is very much less. Mm-hmm. But this is a qualitative disease. You still live to the same age. Right. But you want to make sure you live with quality. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to overactive bladder, once we have diagnosed overactive bladder, very important, overactive bl- bladder is a very specific term to denote any bladder overactivity with no known cause. In other words, you have a tumor. It's not known as overactive bladder. If a tumor means it's a tumor with bladder excessive bladder activity or stone mm-hmm. they can present the so, tumor with uh, an mm. excessive bladder activity yes mm. so uh, overactive bladder is a diagnosis of exclusion mm-hmm. you have to first exclude everything the person cannot have blood in the urine the person cannot have stones the person cannot have infection mm-hmm. some patients present with infection and they have this bladder overactivity but there is not known as OAB or overactive bladder so we have to rule that out so uh, when you say infection the does it also mean the uh, urinary tract? Yes, urinary tract, urinary yeah. tract infection. Right. So once we have already established this diagnosis of overactive bladder, then we have got treatment. We have, it's known as uh, anti muscarinic or anti mm-hmm. They work quite well. Right. We start them on a tablet. It's once a night. Mm-hmm. And then we assess and see whether the, the symptoms have improved. If it doesn't improve, we can top it up. Right top it up to a higher dose or we can uh, we can uh, add in another uh, another uh, medication known as beta 3 agonist which is actually known as mirabregron right a beta 3 yeah, agonist yeah. Yeah. Mm. only if they don't work then we have got intervention in urology you'll be surprised what intervention we use mm-hmm. we use botox injections into the bladder right right now, it sounds very painful but i'm sure yeah. you you, <laughs> you, you have a handle uh, on this many yeah. people will think that if we, when we inject some botox in the bladder we're going to make the bladder more cosmetic <laughs> cosmetic <laughs> <more. laughs> no no but, but we all know it's to strengthen uh, uh, yeah. it's actually to relax the bladder yeah, yeah. so bladder is overactive you know some people uh, do the botox injection yeah. so you can't actually go on a date uh, and say hey take uh, a look at my bladder <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, you see, same thing as you're removing the wrinkles, right? Mm-hmm. You're going to remove the so-called wrinkles of the bladder. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, you're going to make the bladder very relaxed. But that's only temporary. It lasts only nine months. Nine months. Uh, but these are these are for patients who are refractory or where, where the medication has not worked. Right. But there are some cases where even injection of botulinum may not work. Mm-hmm. Then you need surgical. You, you need something to do with, uh, surgery or something like that. Right. Sometimes so. spinal cord injuries. Mm-hmm. So, there are times when we have to... Uh, placing what is known as uh, electrical nerve stimulation, we can use uh, electrodes mm-hmm. in the in the leg, or we can use even surgical electrodes. Or sometimes we have to put in a needle in the sacrum at the right. back, right. and we can use what is known as sacral neuromodulation. Mm-hmm. Now there was a time, uh, but uh, more than a decade ago, where these these things were not available, so we used to do surgery. We used to augment the bladder. That means mm-hmm. the bladder we used to split the bladder open. Take out part of the intestine, put over the bladder, and make the bladder. So this is an augmentation. Yes, mm-hmm. augmentation of the bladder. Mm-hmm. Uh, but usually, on most cases, I would say about nine, eighteen to ninety percent of the cases, the medications now will work. But right. there may be some side effects, constipation and uh, dryness of the throat, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. there's certain contraindications. That means you don't use it for patients who has glaucoma or high pressure in the eyeballs. Right, right. Then we don't use anti muscarinic for overactive bladder. So, wh- what's an artificial sphincter for? Okay. See, there are some cases where the sphincter is completely incompetent or it can't contract. It can't contract. Yeah. So, in these type of people, mm-hmm. they, they have leaking 24 hours a day, irrespective of whether you cough, irrespective of whether you sneeze, even you're sitting down or lying down, it, it, sort of, uh, it just leaks out. Now, these, these are the type of cases where they're usually seen in certain prosthetic operations for prostate cancer or mm-hmm. certain spinal injuries mm-hmm. where it only involve the sphincter alone. If that's the case, we put in an instrument. Right. We be putting an instrument into the bladder neck and the urethra where it's something like a cuff. Mm-hmm. And then with the instrument, we have got a balloon, which is a reservoir and a pump. Right. And the pump, we place it near the, near the scrotum. Mm-hmm. And whenever the patient wants to pass urine, mm-hmm. we, we, all he has to do is press the pump. Right. And it releases a cuff, which holds the sphincter and they will be able to pass urine. Right. So it's a, a, is it a simple procedure? Uh, it's not a simple procedure, mm-hmm. but uh, it's a reliable procedure. Reliable yeah, procedure, yeah. which means um, after the procedure, how long does it take for one to convalesce and, and or be able to get back to normal? 
Uh, within four to six weeks. Four to six yes, weeks, yes. You, you, and and you're back to normal. Yeah, you're back to normal, but right. you have to always use the uh, use the pump to pass urine. Right. I want to get into something now before yeah. I get into what I want to talk about. Yeah. Uh, I want to get into something now that mm. uh, uh, we like talking about a lot. Okay. Kidney stones. Malaysians, we love our kidney stones. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure you have people who come and give you theories yes, about kidney yes. stones. Yeah. You know, too much heat, so yeah. on and so forth. Yeah. So tell us about kidney stones and what do we need to know about kidney stones? Okay, that's very even before the show, I got him to check me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very important, very interesting to know. Yeah, we are in the endemic stone belt for st uh, urinary stone formation. Oh wow! There's there's a there's a belt uh, which is known as endemic stone belt, which which uh, starts off from the Middle East mm -hmm. right up to Myanmar, India, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Philippines, and all. Would you say it's a Malaysia bully moment? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, no. In these regions, the mm. stone rates, urinary stone rates are very, very high. Mm -hmm. You know, why? Uh, it's probably maybe because it's a tropical country, you mm -hmm. sweat a lot, you don't drink enough water, maybe your diet is different. You know, when I went overseas, I went to Bristol for training in, right. in urology. We used to do one stone case a week. There's a particular Tuesday that we use stone cases. Mm. But when I'm Tuesday in Malaysia, was a stone day. Yeah, 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 Tuesday was a stone day. <laughs> not, not, not where people get stoned. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, but uh, uh, in Malaysia, every single day when I was in government hospital, we used to do ten to twelve stone cases a day. Okay, so that's how how different it is now. This the stone formation now is very important. We, if if I were to, if a patient was to ask me, okay, doctor, how do you prevent stones? Now I will I, I will have to explain why stone occurs. Then then that's how you prevent stones. Same thing like a car accident, you know how. How do you prevent a car? You must need to know how it for how it occurs. So you know, okay, you have to wear a crash helmet or seat belt, right. or airbag, or ABS right. or something like that. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have a glass of water, you put in a lot of salt inside, you can get concentrated. You put more, you can get saturated. Then you can get super saturated. Once the glass of water is super saturated, no matter how much of salt you put inside, the crystals will form, aggregate and form back the salt. And that's what's exactly occurring in the patients with uh, who has a urinary stone formation. Their urine is super saturated with uric acid crystals, calcium crystals, oxalate crystals, phosphate crystals and so forth. Mm -hmm. So the most important medication is water add in more water mm -hmm. so i always uh, i always advise them to drink at least 2.5 to 3 liters water a day okay here, yeah. here's the other thing now this yeah. is drinking of water i know yeah. someone who drinks five large bottles of water a day now okay. there's also a concern that people may over drink uh, water uh, and a lot of people don't read about this uh, yes yes and i'm yes. sure you know you can give us some insights on this over drinking water yes. when do we stop drinking water okay that's what i actually advise my my patients because once i tell them some of the patients come in very giddy and tell them tell me that they are passing urine every few minutes mm -hmm. Now, over drinking water is a very, very important thing if you never do. Mm -hmm. That's why there, there are few water drinking competitions overseas where, where an individual can even pass away or so can die or so. Wow. Because they drink too much of water, mm -hmm. the whole brain gets swollen. Yeah. And you, when you drink water, the, so, the sodium levels are con certain constant in the body. When you drink too much water, your water, you're diluting the sodium. Mm -hmm. Once you dilute the sodium, the nerves get more irritable. This again get fits and convulsions. They first will start having headaches, then they start having visual disturbances, and then they start having fits and all that. Right. So for me, I will always advise an individual to drink at least maybe 2 to 2.5 liters a, of water a day. If you're a stone former... 2.5 to 3 liters it, water a day. You know, you've got, you've got some friends who are so yeah. proud of the amount of water they drink. Uh. They even brag to, you know, I go to the bathroom like nine times a day and it's like glass. It's that clear. Yeah, I'm sure you have friends who tell you that. Yeah, yeah. And they're very proud of it. You know, yeah. For some reason, I think sometimes we're doing it wrong. Yeah, so yeah, if you're going you to the bathroom it, yeah. too many times a day, you're overdoing it. Yes. Uh, what I, I would tell my, my uh, patients is, uh, see, there, there are two different ways to know how much to drink. Mm -hmm. Or three different ways. Number one, calculating at least 2.5 liters of water a day. Or number two, if you're thirsty, you drink water. And uh, when you go to the gym or you, you sweat a lot, you drink water. And number three is checking the color of the urine. The color of the urine cannot be orange or cannot be dark, mm -hmm. dark uh, colored. Very mild yellowish color or clear color is just nice. Okay, but if you wake up in the morning and it's dark colored? Uh, if you wake up in dark color, it means you're not uh, uh, drinking enough water the day previously. The, the prior, prior to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you have to make sure that yeah. it's you not... Have, you have to drink educate amount of water, but not excessive. Mm -hmm. Anything over excessive is not good. Mm -hmm. Anything excessive is not yeah, good. Yeah. So I hope that's advice for all of us. Now, yeah. moving into something I want to talk about. People talk about an enlarged 
prostate. Uh-huh. Yeah. So okay. apparently, uh, this term is wrong. Why is that? Yeah, it, this term is actually inaccurate. inaccurate. It may not necessarily mm. be wrong. See, prostate enlargement. Uh, when we use the term, we use the term for the layman, layman people, because they do not understand what prostate compression is all about. See, we, we, we know very well where is, where is the prostate at? The, the, the bladder is here. The prostate is just below the bladder. Now, you have an enlarged prostate. You have a prostate very, very enlarged, but it doesn't compress the urinary passage. You will not have any symptoms. Mm-hmm. Prostate enlargement is just an anatomical term. Right. Just how so, big a prostate so is. The yeah. Enlargement in, in and of itself is not the problem, but yes. it's the compression. compression that it's causing. Yes. Right. So centrifugal enlargement mm-hmm. is not a clinical problem. Centripetal compression is. Mm-hmm. So when they compress the bladder, the bladder becomes very uh, stressed. So the person passes urine very often and you have a very slow flow of the urine right and some more mm. this prostate comp- that's why we, we call this as bph or benign prostatic hyperplasia but mm-hmm. there was a, a time when the urologist wanted to change the term because many people are using the term prostate enlargement so we wanted to change the term to bpo or benign prostatic obstruction mm-hmm. to denote the term but even then when you have the symptoms again like overactive bladder is also a qualitative disease it depends on the bothersome score but it's very important one of the first sign or symptom that you uh, one has with this prostate compression or bph is getting up in the night to pass urine right uh, at one time we we classified that uh, significant symptom as uh, getting up to pass urine is known as nocturia mm-hmm. of more than two times a night right but now we recognize that even getting up once in the night is also so not go not good because you cannot break your sleep Right. There's such thing known as uh, obstructive sleep apnea and sleep fragmentation so then and so forth. How right? then do you hydrate yourself enough to not be to, to not be able to experience nocturia? Uh, oh, in See, a normal person, yeah. even you hydrate yourself enough, okay, they will not get, get up in the say night. Say if you take a full in. glass of water before going to bed. Ah, you're not supposed to do that. Not supposed to. <laughs> See, so we learn something. Don't over drink. Yeah. So you want to finish the two point five liters of water a day. Mm-hmm. Try to drink in the daytime. Or maybe in the evening, or maybe later in the night, but just not just before you you, you right. sleep. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, here's some some of the the frequently asked questions for Malaysians. Okay. We yeah. say, uh, like when something is wrong, they say your body is heaty, uh, urine's dark. Go drink barley. Okay. Uh. Uh, barley. The the advantage of barley is no different from the advantage of water alone. There's only there, one. There we have it. Uh, there's only one thing that has made a, a difference. Mm-hmm. Only one solution: solution containing citrate. So citrus fruits, that means orange, lime juice, lemon juice, uh, limon peel, and all that. Mm-hmm. That's the only thing has been shown to reduce stone formation. Why? Because the citrate prevents aggregation of the crystals. Right. So if you ever ask for an advantage, it's not apple green cider, so not not barley water. Right. So this uh, whole apple cider citrus. thing is is, no. is a myth. Uh, Would you safely say it's a myth? I wouldn't safely say it's a myth, but it's been been propagated so so much. You know why? Why I, I, I will not because there's no proper trials. And mm-hmm. number two is apple. Mm-hmm. If you really go through the content of apple and grape, mm-hmm. it has oxalate, right. and oxalate can form stones. Mm-hmm. So the apple green cider thing, although it's all over the internet and all that, is is not not very specific. Right. Uh, it's not been proven to pre- uh, prevent stones. Right. So you you would be a proponent for. Putting a slice of lime in your glass of water. Uh, if, uh, or I'm lemon, stone farmer, if I'm a stone farmer. Uh, yeah, okay. If you're a stone farmer. <laughs> yes, yes. Or not just plain water. Yeah, will not do. plain water will do. We've got yeah. about one minute left. Your yeah. message to Malaysia with regards to urinary tract health. And uh, that's the camera. So maybe let's talk to all of us. Okay. You need tract health. You need to drink uh, adequate amounts of water. Don't over drink. 2.5 to liters of water is just nice. Uh, you have any urinary symptoms getting up in the night to pass urine or poor flow please see the doctor because even though it's a qualitative disease it is, is so bothersome it can affect your life as well right and uh, to live long you have to live healthy enough but you have to appreciate life for what it is mm-hmm. on that note uh, doc it was a pleasure and an honor having you in the studio dr rajendran sundaralingam consultant urologist and urological surgeon from kpj Damansara Specialist Hospital. It's okay. a pleasure to have you Thank in you. the studio. Stay with us. We're going to come back with more for you right here on Medical Today.
What you put into your body today will shape your life tomorrow. So be sure of good health with Blackmores. Begin better every day with Blackmores. Hello and welcome back to episode 11, season 3.0 of Medical Today with me, Jared Rutnam. We talked about a very interesting subject, which is supplements. Emily Chai from Blackmores Malaysia joined us. We also spoke to a urologist and a urological surgeon, Dr. Rajendran, who had a lot of information for us on the show. Uh, but for now, we'll bring you a video in season 3.0. What we do on a weekly basis is bring you a video on first aid mistakes. And today, we want to look at uh, using antiseptic solutions every time you have a cut or if someone at home has a cut uh, we turn to an antiseptic solution are we doing the right thing now that's the question here's a video let's take a look at how we can better use an antiseptic solution let's take a look at it The mistake is disinfecting wounds with an antiseptic solution. A lot of us have learned to clean our cuts and scrapes with rubbing alcohol, hydrogen peroxide or iodine. But those antiseptic solutions can hurt your healing time. We all know the bubbles we see with hydrogen peroxide. But contrary to popular belief, those are your body's skin cells that help promote healing and the stigma from alcohol is your healthy tissue being harmed. Well, do this instead. To get debris and bacteria out, it's best to hold the wound under the tap and wash thoroughly. If it continues to bleed, apply direct pressure until it stops. According to Best Medicine by Renowned Health, once the cut is clean, you can apply an ointment like Neosporin on it for protection. Ideally, let the cut air out or cover with a loose bandage. Well, uh, there you have it, a video as to how you can use an antiseptic solution or clean a wound uh, the right way. Now, uh, in all times or at all times, with regards to an emergency, if you're lost or don't know what to do, please call 999 and ask for assistance. As cliche or as simple as it sounds, it's the best way forward in times of an emergency. Now, we'd like to once again thank Blackmores. We also like to thank our friends from KPJ, especially KPJ Damansara Specialist Hospital, for joining us on today's show. Next week, uh, we will be speaking to Dr. Harun Ahmad, a consultant surgeon from KPJ Damansara Specialist Hospital. He'll be talking about bariatric and advanced laparoscopic surgery for advanced surgery and advance a weight gain so that's a little something we're going to be looking at right here on next week's episode of medical day with that i'm jared rutnam signing off uh, i hope you enjoyed yourselves watching today's show stay with us of course we'll be having more for you right here on Bernama. once again we'll be back next week with more on medical day bye-bye for now and take care